going to be looking at um, not, not so much the testimony of, our, of the Apostle Paul, but rather the account of his conversion uh, that we have in Acts chapter 9 in verses 1 through 20. And um, I thought as I was looking at the text just a moment ago, maybe a few moments ago, um, maybe we could extend it to verse 22 if that's possible. Okay, so let's begin in verse 1 and we'll read through verse 22. This is just after the stoning of Stephen, where Paul was complacent in it, of course. He was the one that uh, was willing to watch the, uh, the, the, the coats of those who were stoning Stephen. And uh, he uh, obviously was not content with just the death of Stephen. We see him then move on from there to begin to try to do what was in his heart to do, which is to destroy the church. And so we read in chapter 9, verse 1, Now Saul, and again remember Saul, Saul the Pharisee, the one whose name is eventually changed to Paul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked for letters from him to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, both men and women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. As he was traveling, it happened that, as, that he was approaching uh, J- uh, Damascus and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. And he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city and it will be told you what you must do. The men who traveled with him stood speechless, hearing the voice but seeing no one. Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. And leading him by the hand, they brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple of Damascus named Ananias. And the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, get up and go to the street called Straight and inquire at the house of Judas for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much harm he did to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. So Ananias departed and entered the house, and after laying his hands on him, said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you were coming has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he regained his sight, and he got up and was baptized, and he took food and was strengthened. Now for several days he was with the disciples who were at Damascus, and immediately he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogues, saying, He is the Son of God. All those hearing him continued to be amazed and were saying, Is this not he who in Jerusalem destroyed those who called on this name and who had come here for the purpose of bringing them bound before the chief priests? But Saul kept increasing in strength and confounding the Jews who lived at Damascus by proving that this Jesus is the Christ. Amen. Well, may the Lord bless what it is that we see here uh, to our own growth in grace, to our own edification. Now, we began by asking this question, what is it that determines, ultimately determines the direction that we will go? Well, we know it's ultimately the Lord, but what is it that the Lord does to determine or to make us more, as it were, self-determined, that, that uh, will direct the choices that we make in this life Uh, whether we will go one direction or another direction. I mean, if we step back and just think about some of the choices that we make in life, perhaps um, we'll get a better understanding of why we do. Because, for instance, you know, why did we choose to pursue the particular work that we did, the particular vocation? You know, some people choose to be 
doctors, some people choose to be dentists, some people choose to be lawyers, others skilled laborers, and we know from driving around Modesto that there are people who choose to live on the streets, to do nothing, but basically to live off the land in the way that they do. Why, why do we make that choice? Why do we choose the kind of food that we choose? Why do we listen to the kind of music that we listen to? And then, of course, there is that uh, more ultimate question, why did we choose to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ? Why did we choose Him to be our Savior, to trust Him and to follow Him? Even though it is a much more difficult path, while so many people choose not to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, well, as I've said before, it's all a matter of the heart. We do these things because this is what we want to do. As a matter of fact, we would say we always do exactly what we want to do, even when somebody is forcing us to do something. You know, R.C. Sproul used the illustration. If somebody came up to you and held a gun on you and said, you know, give me your money or I'm going to kill you, you would give your money to him because that is what you want to do. You could hold on to the money and you could be shot and he'll get your money anyway or you could just simply give him the money. But you're still choosing to do what you want to do under all circumstances. We always do what we want to do. Jesus told us in our meditation that what comes out of our mouths comes out of our hearts. It's already there. We speak those words because that's what we want to speak, whether good or bad. And what's true of what we say is also true of what we do, which is why Solomon warns us in Proverbs 4.23, watch over your heart with all diligence, for from it flow the springs of life. It directs the whole course of your life. What's in your heart is what you will do. Now this morning we're going to look at an example of this in the life of the Apostle Paul how the Lord changed his direction by changing his heart. And when he changed his heart, it made a powerful difference in the way in which he was living. I mean, he started off as Saul the Pharisee wanting to kill Christians because he hated the Lord Jesus Christ. But after the Lord worked in his heart, he wanted everyone to become a Christian and even to lay down their lives for the glory of the Savior. So first of all, let's take a good look at how Paul started out to see what kind of a man he actually was. Now, he says of himself in one of his testimonies in Scripture in Acts 22, verse 3, he says, I am a Jew, born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city, educated under Gamaliel, strictly according to the law of our fathers being zealous for God, just as you all are today. So Paul was um, born a Jew, born a free man, and notice he was educated under Gamaliel, and Gamaliel was, was a Pharisee. He was uh, the grandson of the famous rabbi Hillel. That was something that um, I wasn't aware of until uh, during the week when I studied this out. I, you know, there's these two opposing views regarding divorce and remarriage. Uh, and here we see, again, the, the fact that the two were related. Now, he was a Pharisee, as I've said, and he was a teacher. And Gamaliel was actually a leader of the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin, the governing body of, uh, of Jerusalem, of the Jews, the religious body. And he held this position during the reigns of Tiberius and Caligula and Claudius Caesar. So he was a man of some renown, some prominence. He was the one, as you know who counseled the Sanhedrin to exercise caution in the way that they dealt with the apostles, warning his associates that if this work that they were engaged in was really of God, not only would they not be able to overthrow it, but they would find themselves fighting against God. Now, Gamaliel was, was a wise man, and he was right. It's too bad that Paul didn't listen a little bit more closely to him because um, perhaps Paul had already graduated by the time this took place, but Paul didn't have this kind of, you know, this, this wisdom to kind of step back and take a look as to whether or not this was of the Lord or not of the Lord. Paul was actually much more aggressive in his approach. Maybe it was because of his zealous nature. 
I mean, he says of himself in Philippians chapter 3, verses 4 through 6, which we're going to be looking at this evening, another place where Paul gives us his testimony. He says, if anyone has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more circumcised the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to the righteousness which is in the law, found blameless. Paul was zealous for Judaism, for the Jewish traditions. He was zealous for the law. That's what it means to be a Pharisee. Now, Gamaliel had counseled caution, but apparently Paul didn't heed that particular counsel. He wasn't cautious. He became the inquisitor of his day. As far as he was concerned, Christians were heretics and should be destroyed. He said as much in his testimony to King Agrippa in Acts 26, verses 9 through 11, where he writes this, So then I thought to myself that I had to do many things hostile to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And this is just what I did in Jerusalem. Not only did I lock up many of the saints in prison, having received authority from the chief priests, but also when they were being put to death, I cast my vote against them, and as I punished them often in all the synagogues, I tried to force them to blaspheme. And being furiously engaged at them, I kept pursuing them, even to foreign cities. Now, obviously, Paul was very zealous for what he believed. He was zealous even before he became a Christian. We should notice that coming to Christ did not make him this way. He was this by nature. Coming to Jesus only changed the direction that he was, you know, directing that particular zeal that he had. When the Lord changes our hearts, when he breaks the power of our old nature, by giving us a new nature with new affections, he doesn't change uh, who we were, okay? He doesn't, we still basically have the same personality as well as the same gifts, the same natural gifts and abilities, but he does change our direction. Now we use what we have for the Lord rather than against the Lord. Now, in our chapter, in our text that we read this morning, we were first introduced to Paul as the one who volunteered to watch the coats of the witnesses who were the first to stone Stephen. Actually, we didn't read this, but it was in a, a two chapters before, at the very end of chapter 7. We read in verse 58, when they had driven him out of the city... They began stoning him, and the witnesses laid aside their robes at the feet of a young man named Saul. So this is where we're introduced to Saul. We do think that he was active earlier. He was a Pharisee. He was trained under Gamaliel. He may have been a part of the Sanhedrin. He was casting his vote against the Christians when they were being put on trial, which means he must have had a vote on the council. So he was there, but now we see him willing to watch the coats of those stoning Stephen and remember the ones who were the witnesses against him to show their sincerity of their witness. They had to be the first to pick up a stone and, and throw it at the one who was being stoned. And Paul was willing to watch their coats. But after this, we see him begin a more extensive persecution in Jerusalem. In chapter 8, verse 3, we read this, but Paul began ravaging the church entering house after house and dragging off men and women, he would put them in prison. Paul wanted to purge Jerusalem of this heresy. But he still wasn't satisfied. He went to the high priest to ask him for letters to the synagogues of Damascus that would authorize him to arrest anyone that he found there that belonged to the way. And remember, the way was simply a, a name for Christianity in those days. For those who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, in order that he might bring them back to Jerusalem. Now, Damascus, he wanted to go to Damascus. Remember Damascus we saw not too long ago? That was the city that was the capital of Syria, the nation that King Asa entered into a treaty with in order to uh, overthrow Baasha's blockade. Uh, when Assyria, and Syria and Assyria are not the same thing, but Assyria was 
was that kingdom that was further towards the east in the Mesopotamian Valley. When they finally came and they conquered the northern kingdom of Israel, they also conquered Syria. Syria became one of its provinces until the Medes conquered the Assyrians and they took over it. And eventually the Romans conquered the Medes and then they took over it. And Damascus then eventually became the seat of the Roman governor in that area. Damascus was located, or actually is located, it still exists, it's 140 miles north of Jerusalem. The trip would have taken anywhere from one to two weeks, one and a half weeks, basically the average, depending upon how fast you were traveling. But Paul's hatred of Christ and of his church was so strong that he was willing to travel that far to arrest anyone he might find there that belonged to the way. Now, the other thing that's interesting, too, is when the Apostle Paul is finally converted by the Lord, he showed that same kind of zeal in his willingness to travel much further than 140 miles in order to bring the gospel to everyone in the Roman Empire, which at that time was essentially the world. Now, again, this is how Paul started out. He hated Jesus. He hated everyone who belonged to Jesus. But we do need to understand that what Paul was experiencing, even though it may have been more severe in degree, was not unusual. This, this is what everybody is like before they come to Jesus. Let me give you an example. Remember when Jesus was put on trial and Pilate offered to release him. All the Jews cried out for his crucifixion. They wanted Jesus to be executed, not just you know, in a quick way, but in the most excruciating way possible, even though he had done nothing wrong and had done many good things. I mean, what was Jesus guilty of? Teaching God's truth, performing miracles, showing them the Father. Absolutely good, absolutely perfect, and absolutely holy, but they hated him for it. And they wanted not only to kill him, but to kill him in this most, again, this most excruciating way. Now again, this is how Paul started out. This is how we all started out. Jonathan Edwards once said that unbelievers would kill God if they could. Now why would he say that? Because God became a man. And when he came into the world, his own people wanted to kill him and they did kill him. So that was Paul's condition. That was our condition. But notice... God did not leave Paul in this condition. Paul, uh, the Lord had mercy upon him. When Paul was approaching Damascus, a bright light from heaven knocked him off his horse. And he heard this voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Well, Paul asked, who are you, Lord? And the Lord replied, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Now, note that Paul was actually attacking the church. He wasn't really attacking Jesus. Jesus was already dead. As far as he was concerned, Jesus' body had been dragged off and buried somewhere else. He didn't believe Jesus was the Messiah. He didn't believe Jesus was in heaven. He thought Jesus was dead. And yet, he was still attacking Jesus. It was Jesus that he hated. As a matter of fact, he says as much in one of his testimonies in Acts 26, verse 9. So then I thought to myself I had to do many things hostile to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. It was Jesus that he hated. And of course, as he saw Jesus and his people and those who called themselves by his name, he hated everyone who was attached to Jesus. This is where his hatred was directed. But his attack, I want you to notice, was against Jesus. One thing we do need to remember is whenever, however, we treat the people of God. We are treating Jesus in that way. Remember in the, the sheep and goat judgment, Jesus is going to say to the sheep and to the goats, inasmuch as you did it to the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me, say that to the sheep, and to the goats, inasmuch as you did not do it to the least of these, my brethren, you did not do it to me. Whatever we do to God's people, we are doing to Jesus. Paul was attacking Jesus' people. And in doing that, Jesus considered that an affront against him. Why are you persecuting me, Saul? 
Well, Jesus then told him to get up and go into the city, and there he would be told what to do, and when he got up, he was blind. Now, he wasn't blind because of the bright lights. Remember, it doesn't say in this text, but it does say in later texts, in his, again, his testimonies, that others saw the light. They saw the light. They heard a noise, but they couldn't make out what the voice was saying, but they saw the light, and they were not blinded. It's more likely that the Lord blinded Paul directly in order to teach him something. And we can only guess at what it was he was trying to do. Certainly it was to humble him. But I think it was to show him something very important about himself. It was to show him his spiritual condition. Paul thought that above everybody else, he could see clearly. I mean, he was a Hebrew of Hebrews. He was a, a zealous Pharisee. He was, you know, he was passing everybody else up in their striving for the first place in Judaism and in Phariseeism, he thought that he knew God's will. He thought he was living a life that was pleasing to him. He thought he was better than his contemporaries. But the Lord was showing him, Paul, you're really blind. You think the Christians are heretics. You want to destroy them. But they are the ones who really love me. And they are the ones who are following my truth. Now think about this for just a minute because how many people are there in the world who think that they see quite clearly? The atheist thinks he sees things clearly. The evolutionist believes that he understands how everything came about and why everything exists. And he has everything figured out. He sees clearly we're all just a great cosmic accident, but he's blind. He doesn't see as he should. And how many people are there in the, in the church who are also blind, who think that they see, who think that they know God's will, maybe even read their Bibles and, and think these things come out of the Bible, but they're really blind to what the Lord says in His Word because they really don't read the Word of God. And they really don't believe what it says. And they're not doing what it says. That's really the definition of spiritual blindness. And that's true of many in the church. And let me just simply say, if this describes any of you here this morning, the Lord is the only one who can open your eyes. Paul could not make himself see. The Lord had to do it. We know from Scripture that this is his work. If that's the case with you, turn to the Lord for his mercy that he might take away your blindness and give you eyes to see. Well, Paul then, as we said, was blind, so he had to be led into Damascus Luke tells us that he was actually blind for three days, during which time he fasted and he prayed. You know, a question arises in the experience of the Apostle Paul as to when he was actually converted. You know, when did the Lord give him that love for the truth that forever changed the direction of his life? When was it? Was it on the road when the Lord knocked him off his horse and showed him his superiority and he says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And Paul says, who are you, Lord? Was it when he called Jesus Lord? Well, you know, the word Lord doesn't always mean Yahweh. Not everybody who uses it in Scripture is saying that you are Yahweh, the covenant God of Israel. It's used often simply as a title of respect. Was it when Paul was fasting and praying well, you know, that's what a Pharisee would do when confronted with something like this. They would fast and they would pray and they would seek the Lord, but it doesn't necessarily mean they were saved. I mean, read the Scriptures and you'll see that Jesus even rebuked the Pharisees for their continual fasts, but their fasting was only to be seen by men. Certainly at this point, Paul was humbled, but it doesn't necessarily mean he was saved. Well, maybe it was when Ananias prayed for him and his eyes were opened. Just thinking about Ananias for a moment, remember Ananias was afraid. Ananias knew what Paul had done. He knew why he had come to Damascus. But the Lord encouraged him. The Lord reassured him. The Lord strengthened him. And he told him Paul was his chosen instrument. That the Lord had actually called this one who in the entire world was perhaps his most devout enemy to be his most devout spokesman, to the one who had made his people suffer the most. This was the one that he had chosen to suffer for his name's sake as he would bear his name before Gentiles, kings, and the sons of Israel. You know, Paul 
experienced. What he writes in Romans 9, verses 15 and 16. He says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it does not depend on the man who wills or the man who runs, but on God who has mercy. How did Paul come to know Jesus? He was doing everything he could to destroy him. And yet, the Lord changed him. The Lord is absolutely sovereign. He will have mercy on whom he has mercy. It does not depend upon man, the man who wills or the man who does. It depends upon God who has mercy. And so, Paul understood that in his own experience, and Ananias understood that. As he listened to the Lord, and he went and he prayed for Paul. Lord, if you're calling this man, then I know I'm going to be safe when I go to his house, and he's not going to try to kill me. And so Ananias went, and he prayed for Paul, and the Lord restored his sight. Now, if Paul wasn't converted before, he certainly was now. His whole direction changed, didn't it? He got up. He immediately was baptized. Basically, he received the covenant sign that identified him with the Lord Jesus Christ. He broke his fast. He ate some food so he could gain up his strength. And then he immediately went out and began to proclaim Jesus as the Son of God. So much so that the people who knew him wanted to kill him. So the one who once wanted to destroy this heresy called Christianity was now willing to lay down his life so that others might come to know the Lord Jesus. Now again, this, this is the experience of the Apostle Paul, but again, this is the experience essentially of everyone who comes to the Lord Jesus Christ. We were going one direction. The Lord changed our hearts and now we're going another direction. So let's close this morning by just stepping back for a moment and taking a good look at our lives to, to ask this question, have we experienced this transformation? Do we have this kind of heart? Has the direction of our lives been changed? Which is really the only evidence of a changed heart, isn't it? If Paul had not changed his direction, we'd assume he's still the same person. But when the heart changes, the direction changes because we do what we want to do. And the question is, do we want to do what it is the Lord calls us to do? And are we actually doing that? Are we willing to lay down our lives to tell others about Jesus? Are we willing to put our lives at risk to stand up for his truth so that others will come to know him? This morning as we were praying in the back uh, before the service, uh, we were praying for Fikret Bojek, who could have been enjoying all the, the freedoms of uh, America that we, we have and the relative safety of America. But he decided he wanted to go to Turkey instead to try to reestablish the seven historic churches that we read about in the book of Revelation. But you know that Turkey is a, you know, it's a, a Muslim country and they don't take too kindly to people coming in and proselytizing. And you know if a Muslim turns to the Lord Jesus Christ and they renounce their Islamic religion, they're number one on the hit list. They will be killed for that. So it's very, very tough work that he's doing. Right now, his life is threatened. Right now, he's, you know, there, an American has been arrested and he's in jail because he's been sharing the gospel with others. And Fikret uh, is willing to stay in Turkey to do this work for the name of the Lord Jesus, even though it means he may also be arrested and put into jail. Now, again, he's doing what, what the Apostle Paul would do, isn't he? Um, at least he's going that direction. And the question is, are we going that direction? Would we be willing to do the same thing that he is doing or would we leave the country in order to retreat to a place of safety? And are we retreating to places of safety rather than standing up for the truth and speaking out for the Lord Jesus Christ? Now Luke goes on to tell us, remember, that Paul was so zealous, he was so open with the gospel that in just a very few days, the Jews wanted to kill him. I think at first they were somewhat dazed by the fact that this change had taken place in this man. He came here to arrest them. And now he's proselytizing. Now he's doing the very same thing they're doing. What, what happened to him? And so they were caught off balance. But then their hearts solidified and they said, this guy has to die. 
And we know that he didn't die because he was lowered out of a basket. He escaped the city and so forth. He was, he was spared. But the fact is, he was willing to do it. And he did it. Now, the question we need to ask is, is this. Do those whom we know, do they know that we're Christians? Do they know that we're believers? Is there anybody that's angry with us because we've taken a stand on the truth? Because we are naming the name of Jesus, we're identifying with him, we're Christians, and because we're telling them that they need to become Christians too, that what they're doing is wrong, it's, it's sinful. If they continue down that direction, it's, it's going to lead them to God's judgment and hell. Are there people who are angry at us because we've told them the truth? Now, we may not have the same degree of zeal that Paul had. Remember, this was his nature. This is the way the Lord made him, even before the Lord called him. But do we have any zeal for the Lord and for his work? We might not have the same gifts that Paul had. We certainly don't. None of us here do. But are we using the gifts that the Lord has given to us to serve him and to serve other people? We really need to take a step back. You know, sometimes, I, I really honestly think, sometimes we get so caught up in our, just, just like, I don't know, just sort of existing within our own bodies and doing the things that we do that we never really step back for a moment, just kind of step away from ourselves and take a look. What, what am I doing? What am I thinking? What, am I really acting according to what I believe or am I somehow caught into some kind of a rut? And I'm not really doing this. Uh, am I really what I think I am? I need to step back and take a look if, if I am being transformed. Do I have that zeal? Do I have that love? Has the direction of my life changed? We need to step back and look. Now, if we step back and look and we don't see these things in ourselves, then we really haven't come to Jesus. Because when we come to Jesus, it changes our lives. We're no longer the, the person we were in a very real sense. We're no longer going the direction we were going. Now we're going a new direction. We used to hate Jesus, and now we love Jesus. Shouldn't that make a difference in the way we live? Of course. The Bible says that it will. So is that change there? Is that change of direction there? If it isn't, turn to Jesus. He's the only one who can change your heart. But if we step back and look at ourselves, I think we would all also agree that if there is any zeal and any love for Jesus, we would all agree on this, that it's not what it should be. None of us are what we want to be in the Lord Jesus Christ, which is why we need to keep pressing forward. Now, that's exactly what the Apostle Paul did. He was not completed in, in a day. Uh, the Lord had to do a lot in his life, but he got started and he worked tirelessly and he was beating his body and he was fighting continuously to move forward to become like the Lord Jesus Christ. Now that's what we're going to look at this evening when we come back as Paul describes for us his heart and his desire and his goal in life because that is what the Lord wants us to be. He says, you know what? This is what I was doing. This is what I've told you. This is what you need to be doing. And if you're doing anything else, he says the Lord will show you that. He will because he is a gracious father who cares about us. And he will correct us when we're not going the right direction. So this evening, that's, that's what we're going to focus on, that new desire and that new goal that the Lord has given to us. Well, for now, let's, let's bow in a moment of prayer. As you know, we're going to come to the Lord's table in a few moments. We, we remember that this is a remembrance of the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to remember what he has done for us in order to set us free from our sins. But this is also a time of examination, isn't it? This is where we step back. This is why it's good to have the Lord's Supper every week because every week we're faced with, with this self-examination, which if we don't do, we're coming to the Lord's table at our own risk. You know, Paul warns the church of Corinth that we can receive the discipline of the Lord rather than his blessing if we don't examine ourselves. And if we actually come to the table as unbelievers, we're eating and drinking greater judgment and condemnation to ourselves on the day of judgment because we're coming in, hip in, in hypocritical spirit. 
Now, that sin will be forgiven if we turn to the Lord Jesus Christ, but we don't want to store up wrath for ourselves in the day of wrath, so we need to examine ourselves. Are we believers? How do we know? Take a step back. Has the direction of your life changed? Are you going the way that Paul went, the way that Jesus went? That's how you know that you're a Christian. That's how you know your heart has been changed, is by that change of life. We also realize we don't do it perfectly, so at this examination, we also need to step back and look, where are we failing? Where are we doing things we shouldn't be doing? Where are we not doing things we should be doing? And we need to repent of those as well. So let's take just a moment, shall we, and let's examine ourselves as we prepare to come to the table.